when the moon is cast along, uh, edited by Scott. And one of them is Dr. Kavan Dattatunga. Dr. Kavan Dattatunga is an astronomer by profession. His uh, hobbies extend to several things, including numismatics and archaeology. He was the past president of the Sri Lankan Numismatics Association and is still very much associated with the with, uh, Sri Lankan Numismatics Association. He is also very well networked in the Sri Lankan uh, Numismatics and Monetary uh, Fraternity. He is also a key member of the Sri Lankan Rationalist Association. Dr. Tatunga, despite being a very uh, a uh, famous individual is extremely humble and courteous and welcomes all collectors when they come to Sri Lanka and helps them with insightful tips. He also has one of the best uh, collections of Lankan coins anyone that ever has. And his site, lakadiva.com, is the source uh, of uh, research for experts all over the world. It's a very well known site. I can go on and on, but I'll give the mic over to Dr. Katoka so you can listen to this uh, insightful lecture. Thank you, Shami. Thank you, Shami, for that kind of introduction. Um, uh, when it comes to India, so it is manageable to try to do a complete website on Sri Lankan coins and uh, banknotes. And that is what I aim to do when I started this website 25 years ago, mostly on Sri Lankan coins. And then later, somewhere around 2015, I expanded this to have Sri Lankan banknotes as well. And now the banknote collection, because it's, it lasts only for, from 1785, is almost complete, of, of not complete, it's complete of all known uh, essays and specimens. But the coin collection is sort of less, com the website is less complete because that goes down to 300 BC. And I really need to do much more research to complete that, but it's most probably most probably 90 or 95 percent complete. So these are my two websites, coins.laktiba.org and notes.laktiba.org. And apologize that yesterday for some server problem which I still not be able to solve, those two sites are down. And hopefully I will get it up today or tomorrow when I go back and argue with the people. Okay, so Sri Lanka is, as I said, is a small country with not too much. Sri Lankan stuff started about maybe 6th, 3rd century, 6th century BCE and I sort of divided it into ancient, medieval which is about from 6th century to 16th century, colonial which is the period that we were under the Portuguese, Dutch and British from uh, 16th century and I stopped change over at 1869 even though uh, it's still modern, to the modern region, uh, saying after 1870. So our oldest coins are Panchmark coins, which are actually most of it would have come from India to Sri Lanka. And uh, but we are I'm trying to do some research to find out whether we have in Sri Lanka uh, Panchmark coins which are different from the Indian ones, or which are different punches. So I have got a hold of about 1,200, which I'm trying to analyze to see if there's any different ones or ones that I can associate with Sri Lanka that has not been done as yet. The oldest inscribed coin that is not Indian, right, of Indian origin, it's dated to about 300 BC. This was found in an archaeological dig and it's, uh, it has the Brahmi inscription Date and it has a uh, sort of crude version of the swastika with the railing. That's the oldest known uh, Sri Lankan coin. So the next period is the period of from about 2nd century BC 
where we have a number of coins, which uh, this is a fairly interesting coin. It's a, what they call the elephant and swastika coin. And it's fairly large. And, and it has four symbols. The elephant, the gold, uh, sorry, the gold tree, the swastika, and the chaitya. And that is associated with the symbols associated with the Buddha's life and sort of even considered as a commemorative coin of the visit of Arahat Mahinda in around at the time in the third century, second century BC during the period of Ashoka. The rare swastika, which is the one with the railing at the bottom, four spikes upwards, and the swastika on a tie, that's a symbol which is, does not appear on any Indian coins. So this is a symbol unique to Sri Lankan coins that if you find that symbol in a, on a coin that you find in India, it most probably came from Sri Lanka. Because I, this symbol is not on thing. And if we use this symbol, it's like the royal symbol for Sri Lanka from about 2nd century BC to about 2nd century AD. So this is also another one, a very nice uh, real, uh, Lakshmi coin with uh, the Abhishek. It's called Lakshmi. I'm not 100% sure that uh, that is Lakshmi because I feel that Lakshmi is normally always drawn with four hands. And this coin definitely, all these coins definitely have only two hands. And it may be not Lakshmi, it could be quite a few, it could be Parvati or some other goddess, but it was called by some Britisher Lakshmi and after that everybody calls it Lakshmi. So <laughs> I think the name is more generic than actual. That, uh, then the real swastika comes on a coin, which is the tree symbol and the swastika on the other side. Elephant with the swastika on the other side. Those are fair and not extremely common. Uh, then this is uh, the lion and the swastika on the other side, which is fairly rare. And the horse with the swastika, which is a very rare coin, which is found in archaeological things. So there is this whole series of coins with uh, symbols, and it has also the chaitya in this coin at the bottom of the coin. There is lots of uh, the same symbols coming over and over again. Okay, then somewhere around 20, 2027, there was this mass point which was with a lion on one side and four dots on the other side. These are points which have been found. Then from the 3rd to the 7th century, this was after the Roman Empire broke down. And Sri Lanka, we were getting coins from Rome in trade and those coins were being used in in uh, local transactions as well. But when the Roman Empire went down and we didn't have coins to trade with, uh, inside, the Sri Lankans went and made their own Roman coins, what they call imitation Roman coins. And that, they are named after Naimana, which is the place where a large hole in, of uh, these coins were found originally about 100 years ago. and. Uh, the, uh, I have basically got a hold of about 5,000 points, uh, which I'm hoping to analyze to get much more information. But these are uh, imitation Roman coins, uh, which have sort of sort of Roman. Uh, this is a sort of standard Roman foot brass coin, Constantine the thing, and then you have the imitation ones, which are. Uh, something like this, which are not particularly Roman, there's a mixture of local and Roman, and with the lettering definitely wrong. Then we, we went through various influence, India, South Indian influences, and during the time of the Pandava, there was this uh, coin which had a, uh, both a, a lion and a <coughs> coin on it, and that that is uh, considered a, a fairly interesting coin. Then there is a whole lot of uh, 
bull and fish. I mean, this is I found in India as well. But we Arvans have uh, the number of lines below, right? Arvans have two lines below, and uh, Indian ones I think have three lines below. And that also have got a code to sort of try to analyze. There are different types of fish drawn on all these coins, which is a study in itself. We, I switch next into the medieval period from the 8th century to about the 13th century. This is the canonical uh, Sri Lankan gold kahawan, uh, which this is a, one of the type 1 A coins. I, mean, I like, that, like this very much because uh, it is at the sun and moon. This is the sun. So this is the sun and moon here. And so it's called sun and moon uh, gold coin. And the word sun and moon is used on the coins because quite long, even now, some of the deeds and the old deeds were written saying until such time as the sun and moon exists. So era, in single they say era and the poverty, which I think as an astronomer I find that very interesting because you know we get destroyed if the sun and moon no longer exist because the world in maybe in five billion years time when the sun is ends its lifetime we will no longer be here. So that concept is there, you know, as long as the sun is It's a very interesting concept uh, which is very old as well. This the Kahamanu is uh, not all that rare. But for some reason, the other kahawan, the half kahawan, is extremely rare. And there is only about five such specimens known. Uh, Jan Lingen has one, not very good candidate. There are two with a collector in Sri Lanka, I know, uh, Shamil Piri. And there is uh, this other kahawan, which was in the National Museum, was considered the best specimen. Unfortunately, it was stolen in 2012. They claim that the robber merited it, but I have a feeling that there is more to the story that we do not know. The Kahavano comes in half, the half is very rare, but they have a quarter as well as the one eighth, Akka. Uh, so, of various types, and I have managed to catalog about 45 different types of uh, Kahavano. Um, large number, 25 types and maybe with other variations, about 15 or one uh, of uh, these coins. And it's a very interesting study. When Raja Raja Chola came to Sri Lanka, he took that Kahavano and he replaced the uh, letters which are written in Nagari uh, on the side, which was Sri Lanka Vibhuku Vibhu, which was uh, uh, to the King of Lanka, to Raja Raja. So the lettering changed from uh, uh, to Raja Raja, and that was his coin. And that was uh, okay. And then there was uh, the Raja and the Chola's coin of 1040 to 1044, which had this symbol here, which is the one I think I'm sure these coins were also found in India, but uh, which has the Utamala on the side. The, when Raja Chola dynasty took over the Pallavas and the Cheras and the umbrella to talk of the empire. One of the interesting things that I have done with these coins is I am a scientist, uh, I sort of needed to do metallurgy. So I got these XRF measurements of these coins and one of the immediate results of it was to realize that um, uh, they, they, they use much more silver than they use copper. So if you get a coin with, which has less purity than gold, it's mixed with silver, not with copper. The copper to silver ratio was definitely, uh, uh, copper was much less than silver, maybe one tenth to one fifth the amount of copper. So that, that was very interesting to find because all the fake coins, which were made recently were mostly made with sovereigns. And sovereigns don't have any silver. The British sovereigns, the Australian sovereigns have silver, but the, which are not normal. Again. The British sovereigns don't have silver. So if you find a coin where the ratio is uh, high, uh, that the copper is more than silver, it's most probably a fake. 
right? Which was a very interesting thing that I think anybody dealing with coins should actually use it to identify the fakes. And this particular gold coin was the first gold coin I bought in 1993 from Sphinx and sold to me as genuine. But now I know it's definitely fake. Right? For two things. When I bought it, it was too heavy. It was five grams. Uh, and some of I was suspicious, but I, sort of, I didn't know very much about coins. I mean, this is early days when I was just uh, I had just got a few coins from my grandfather and I was dealing with it. Then later on, recently, then I did this test with uh, and found that it was uh, uh, a copper ratio of equal copper ratio of one, so I knew it was not unlikely to be genuine. And then subsequently, I found a coin which was cast, which had all the bubbles, identical mark, and some, why this is heavier, somebody played at this <laughs> to remove the, 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 the ca casting marks, and that's why it was there. So I have definite proof that Sphinx, and I still can remember when Sphinx told it to me, I knew nothing about coins. I asked him, how do you know it's genuine? They looked at me and said, we yeah, are Sphinx of London. We started in 1666. So I said, okay, I can't argue with you. <laughs> but you get, that shows that one has to really be an expert on the field that you're collecting. You can't base your thing on anybody, even on the big dealers like Sphinx, who you expect should know better. Uh, so. Then Sri Lanka was united under Vijay Babu in 1055 and he removed Raja Raja's name and put Vijay Babu uh, on the side. This had only six letters, but and I particularly like that coin because that coin also appeared in a Sri Lankan stamp, the identical coin that I have in my collection. Because it was used, the original owner actually gave it the post office to, to uh, draw their picture <laughs> and I end up there. There's another book which is quite interesting which is the Vijaya Tantra which talks a lot about uh, minting of coins and gives a thing and in that it says that the king's name must be written with seven characters, seven letters. So subsequent, this must have been around that period because subsequently all king's letter coins had seven letters. So whatever his name, he had to somehow to modify it to get it to write in seven letters. And this is the and Pahu, the first which is the most famous of our kings. And he has the Parakram Pahu written in seven letters. This is, uh, there is the one name of that, uh, of Dharma Shukadeva, and that's a very rare coin and it has that Marshal where they were uh, written in also in certain characters. It appears not many gold coins have been found. I think there was one report that the Mahatmambahu, I think, he didn't have as many gold after this period. So there is silver coins, silver nickel. And then back in 1415, Mahatmambahu VI, Put an additional logo on the on this coin, which is a secret lion on the on the side. It's that appear very well. You can actually all these coins are on my website, and you should be able to see it much more clear. This is a Seto coin. These are the coins from North in North Jaffna area, and uh, which is which has the gold Nandi on the side and the standing uh, man. And that's another coin that appeared in the same set of <laughs> stamps. So quite nice to have it. I missed the gold coin. Uh, this is also another Setu Chakra coin. Quite a few Setu coins that I have recorded on my website. We did find a large hoard of Western Ganga's Gajapati Pagodas in Sri Lanka, in Jaffa. 
and so I would consider that also a part. So most of what I collect, if I when I go to coins which were definitely not indigenous, I go by the records in Cotton, which is like the Bible of Sri Lankan coinage. And this is one of the coins that are described there. 179 performed in 1922. Then we go to the colonial period. Uh, the Portuguese came and took over the part of the coastal areas in 1505. And their symbols were their own symbol and the gridiron. This gridiron, which is this symbol here, is because the, the fort in, in Colombo was called San Lorenzo because it was Lorenzo de Almeida, son of Vasco de Almeida, who actually first came to Sri Lanka. And so since the fort was called, uh, his name was Lorenzo de Almeida, he named the fort St. Lawrence. And St. Lawrence was actually martyred, which was, he was grilled on a grill in the second century, uh, sec uh, second century AD. And because of that, that symbol of grill with a flame underneath is the symbol that is used in a lot of uh, original Sri Lankan uh, coins. Uh, that uh, Portuguese coin, this is the 1631 Ganga. You have uh, C low written on the two sides and 1640 that was. And some of our coins were minted in Goa. So G stands for Goa and quite a few of our coins are minted in Goa. Then we had uh, silver larynx which was sort of Persian origin but rather sort of a bent unlike the straight ones in India. And that's why they were called bent, cuckoo, like uh, hook, hook larynx. 1655, the Dutch took over from the Portuguese and we were under the, we have been under the uh, Portuguese for 150 years, then we were under the Dutch for the next uh, 150 years. And those coins, during that period, there's a very interesting coin which is associated with India because there was a shipwreck off the coast, south coast of Sri Lanka and a very large hoard of coins, thousand coin bags were found by uh, a group associated with Arthur C. Clarke. This was in six, 1962, which actually is the origin of maritime archaeology in Sri Lanka. And this was the Indian boat that was going from, uh, uh, most probably from Surat to around the coast of Sri Lanka to the, uh, to the eastern part of India. And they had taken bags of thousand coins and these bags had uh, basically the coir ropes of this one. So the, most of the coins in this list were 1701 no Surat rupees of the 46th year. And there are so many coins that if you most probably find this particular year, it will most probably come, be coming from that board. <laughs> Uh, year 46 thing. But I got a set of points from that board which I have put on my website which have years just before that. So I think one bag at least they had sort of uh, minted enough and then I didn't have enough to make the thousands so they would have put some points from their in circulation into that bag because I found about five years before and after that year in that, in that board of points which is interesting, which are proprietary. So this is sort of a line drawing of that coin. This is a, one of these full thousand log coins, which is uh, uh, sort of a thousand coins, if you 11 kilos, <laughs> 25 pounds. And uh, it's in the Smithsonian because it was gifted by Arthur Clark to the Smithsonian. I have a small lump with few other coins that are around in the other ones of the different years. And it, in this lump, there is even a half rupee which is stuck in the lump, which is quite funny because I wouldn't have expected a half rupee to be in a bag of uh, thousand points. We next had uh, another coin called Atmila, 
which was issued by the Dutch. It's an extremely rare, rare coin. I don't have it in my collection. There are a few of them around with the army and a few other collectors. We had a Dutch, I mean, we have a lot more. I'm not showing all of them. I'm just showing a few. They uh, led may not of uh, tin. This one was tin. And this is the most famous of the bar coins that were sort of issued in 1785. Uh, this is, I also don't have a genuine specimen, but large numbers of these have been sold in major auctions, which are all fake. So it's one of those things when I sort of keep seeing this fake stuff coming on auction, I sort of report to them that this is a fake one, which you shouldn't uh, bother about, and then most of the time they remove it from the auction. So then, from there we come 1785, which was when the bar was issued, and at the same time, 17, uh, 1785, Sri Lanka started minting coin, uh, minting currency notes. And this was one of the oldest, and I think next, I have not seen images of anything from 1785 to 1794, which is the uh, thing. And I think those were all demonetized, and every one of them must have been destroyed around that time. That none I have ever seen in any collection. This one from 1795, September 17th, went under auction in London, spin auction. And it has the validity of the note written in Dutch, Sinhala and Tamil. And uh, uh, it was sort of, it became in 1796 when the British came around, they accepted all this Dutch currency, uh, 50,000 pounds of these notes as their liability. And they stamped them and said, we will pay 3% uh, interest on it until such time as they are redeemed. So it became no longer currency but a bond. And I think that they did something wrong because they couldn't get these back. And the last ones I think were got back only in 1912 or something. Because they said, you're paying 3%, we can carry on. Right? The British government had to continue to pay 3% to them uh, as long as the owner held this bond. So it was, I think, uh, profitable for them to hold the bonds, but either for some reason, most of those ones which were redeemed, they have gone and been destroyed, but there are very few of these notes about. Uh, this is also a lower denomination of two rich dollars which were issued uh, in 1796. So the Sri Lanka in Ceylon at that time was started in 1796 as a part of the Madras presidency. So we were sort of just controlled by the Madras presidency. And I think in 1802, Sinon became a British crown colony. Unlike India, which became a British crown colony only in 1859. So if we had not become a uh, crown colony of uh, England in 1802, we would have been part of India most probably rather than a separate country because India merged about 50 countries into creating India. And we would have made another thing like Tasmania off the coast of Australia. <laughs> but why the British created us by making us a different country was because we had 60 years when we were independent of India and the rule of the East India Company. So I think the existence of Ceylon uh, works out to be because, so they, during so this period there were Madras presidency coins which were used in Sri Lanka. And this uh, diagram, the cartoon from 1803, explains why the British created Sri, Sri Lanka. They basically say this is the state of Ceylon, and right from that they have various things in, uh, uh, what is it? Uh, well, uh, uh, places, governments, uh, rewards, uh, various things that they were hoping to get by having this strong colony. So the British bureaucracy decided we can have a colony and that will increase the British uh, Raj or whatever, rather than giving it all to the East India Company. 
So they established themselves and then used that same concept and they took over India completely from the East India Company in 1869. But we got a uh, separate identity in 1801. There are very rare fixed dollar notes from around that time, 1806, which are just printed locally in, in the government press in Sri Lanka. There, was, there are nice silver dumps. Uh, this is a very interesting note. It is 100 rich dollars, 100 fixed dollars, which they offered to pay back in copper. And it, it, I worked out how much of copper. It would be 43 and a half kilograms of copper. They redeemed that one single note. Then we had silver rich dollars. Uh, and Sri Lanka, India, British, even though they came to Sri Lanka, they took continued the Dutch currency denominations up to 1825. In 1825, they said, we don't want uh, today, we will make Sri Lankans use British, uh, British currency pound shillings and pence. So in 1825, uh, we went to pound shillings and pence. We had, they issued smaller denominations of quarter farthings, which were never issued in England. And we were on a, and there was a one and a half uh, pence which was used in J Jamaica and in Ceylon. And, but the East India one rupee coin was unofficially the coin that was circulating in Sri Lanka. Because till about 1831 in England sent all these coins, their coins, to Ceylon. And there was a bit of a mix up of the exchange rate. So our jewelers just melted them. We're not selling you any more coins because you don't know how to use them. <laughs> and after that, there's no Indian rupees coming in, or British rupees, uh, shillings and pounds coming into the country. They used Indian rupees, unofficial, not official, but unofficial. The, this is a banknote from uh, Bank of Ceylon, which is not the current Bank of Ceylon, but a poor Bank of Ceylon, which didn't last very long. And there were treasury notes, which are a very interesting series of notes that I've been studying. We, they made, somewhere around when the, when the gold was found in Australia, uh, they started making gold a legal tender in Sri Lanka. Now gold was okay to make it a legal tender, but it's too valuable a coin for normal trade. So we had gold coins, declared gold, silver gold, uh, legal tender, the Australian mint coins also declared legal tender, the soft mints and the halves. And we had notes from banknotes, all the private banks who did that were allowed from 1844 in 1884 uh, to issue their own notes. So they had a lot of Indian, uh, like the Oriental Bank, which would have been represented in India the Chartered Mercantile Bank of India, London and China, which have branches in Ceylon, as well as the Asiatic Bank. Now, the small change was a problem. I mean, India and British were not selling us coins, use the tokens to uh, pay them for the labor, and the labor had to buy their produce and their whatever, their rice and whatever, using those tokens in the their store. So it was like a closed economy. So not many tokens were pre-minted, maybe 500,000 tokens were printed because they were not valid outside the state. So this is a very interesting collecting thing. I have about 85 different tokens. There is about 120 or so different tokens which have been catalogued and new ones are appearing all the time. These are some of the coffee tokens from that era. I have not, all of them have been catalogued in my website. In 1870, Sri Lanka decided to go decimal. That is, uh, British went only in 1970. And then the Indians went uh, decimal, I think, in what? 96. 96. 56. 56. 56. So we actually made a, there was a, a referendum asking people whether they wanted to go decimal. And the referendum voted, yes, we want to go decimal. So in 1850, in 1870, the events were 100, rupee, 100 cents equal to 1 rupee. And we used, but and legally, the Indian silver rupee also was declared legal tender in Sri Lanka. 
So for from 1870 to about 1970, the Indian silver rupee was legal tender in Sri Lanka. So those appear in various types. And in fact, uh, I got a, bought a, cat, a catalog of these things which are very interesting. They are sort of, you have to do a lot of research to find out what they are. This is uh, a bank note, signed bank note, which actually two parts, two different bank notes put together uh, of 1885, which was the first time that when the coffee tokens and the coffee estates went bust because the coffee got a blight and the coffee industry broke down. Was replaced by the tea industry, and all the Oriental Bank and all those banks went bankrupt, and it ended up with the government taking over the issue of currency. And from 1885, we only had government currency, and those, these notes are very similar to the Indian notes of that era. So this is five, five, rupee, uh, five rupees again, and we mean the. Uh, uh, 50 cents, 25 cents, and a 10 cents in 1892. And after that, I think the Indian global fractional coins were no longer legal tender. And very interestingly, for about one year, this Portuguese Indian rupee was made legal tender and then removed. I have no idea why, but it was legal tender in Sri Lanka from 1892 to March to uh, July 17, 1893. No idea why, but it's all recorded. Then we had Edward the seventh, George the fifth, and then we have currency notes. We didn't put the, uh, the king on our currency notes at all. And another interesting thing is that we issued books of coins. In India, they issued it only for the one rupee. Yeah. Booklets. Booklets. And in Sri Lanka, we had the two rupee and the five rupee which is 25 uh, notes of uh, uh, the 2 rupees since 1926 and 20 notes of rupees 5, which was 100 rupees in 1929. And one of my prized possessions is an intact book of uh, 25 rupee notes of 1946, which I think does not exist anywhere else. It was found in my grandfather's cupboard after he died. He had lost it. <laughs> and I was lucky to find it. Uh, there were sort of uh, notes uh, from the first time. We started getting more pictures and colorful notes from that time. There is this fairly interesting note which is, which could cost five cents, which you could tear in two and make change of two cents and three cents. This was more time, uh, times when they couldn't make coins. And we went all the way up to 10,000 uh, rupee note, and this 10,000 rupee note and not, did not go into circulation. It was only used between interbank transactions. Then we had our first currency starting from 1959, 20th of January. And uh, King George, we had an issue of a five cent coin, which was issued only in proof, I have no idea why. And then from 1956, we had this nationalist uh, Thing and what we had was we we didn't want, want to put put the Queen's picture on our no, on our coins, so we removed it from the currency notes and only a two cent coin has been printed with the Queen's picture. What is I found more interesting that the 1942-45 King Emperor of India coins were minted in the British. Birmingham Mint and the British Mint to all the way up to 1962, stating George the Fifth uh, King of, uh, of India because Sri Lanka didn't want, didn't want to put a, the uh, Queen on it, so they have carried on printing the old notes long after King George the Sixth was dead. <laughs> Which is, I mean, if you get if you get the wrong mint records, uh, I didn't know it was legal for. England to actually win for all the king's coins. <laughs> uh, we had uh, so the, we had the first we removed the one rupee in 1963, uh, but the notes removed all the English from their notes and replaced it with Singhala in 1956. 
This was the 25 free coin which was issued around that same time for the 25th anniversary and it's our first commemorative coin of uh, in from that night a coat of arms of Ceylon who have ended in Sri Lanka. And very interesting, these no coins have Lanka rather than Sri Lanka. Now this was sometime around 1963 when our first coins went out and it has Lanka here as well. Because the name Sri Lanka is officially adopted only in 1972. Actually on stamps it appears in Sinhalese all the way from 1948. So it is similar to what is now being discussed about Bharat being in India's name to be changed to Bharat. <laughs> and it was a we went from you know, Ceylon to Sri Lanka in 48, but we officially went to Sri Lanka only in 72, when the English was changed into uh, Sri Lanka. But we used the name Sri Lanka on our stamps and all. Uh, so they went, uh, then after that, it was Sri Lanka after 1972. Uh, we had a new logo uh, in 77. And one of the most interesting parts, I don't know, I have not studied Indian words, uh, is that our, uh, the ultraviolet images in some of these Sri Lankan tones are absolutely beautiful. Now that particular note is the Tenupi bird, which is a fairly popular thing, but under UV light, it looks completely different and extraordinary. And in fact, this looks like an eclipse to me that he has drawn an eclipse of the sun. That is the thousand rupee note of 1981. And these are beautiful when, when under ultraviolet it looks so beautiful that one wonders if people know that looking at one of those notes under ultraviolet light it would come out to be so beautiful. And the other note is the uh, 2000 okay. So all of our notes from 1971 all the way up to now have UV images, but these are the best three that some artists have spent a lot of time designing that is a UV image with intricate detail more than the known as. We had uh, a, a second resident issued a silver rupee, which was actually the last silver rupee, uh, but it was not a circulating coin. There was a circulating coin, but the silver one didn't circulate. The same president decided that our name was bad for him, uh, so he changed his name from, uh, he changed the country, or officially changed the name of the country from SRI, SRI Lanka to SHRI Lanka, thinking that it will avoid this astrological malice that he was believed in. Unfortunately, he was killed the next, assassinated the next year by the Tigers, and he went back to the old spell. So the stamps from Sri Lanka from 1992 June to 1993 December has this spelling SHRI, but no, only one coin got this thing which is the NCRD coin of 1993. In 78, uh, we issued a polymonol, the only polymonol that we have ever issued. Uh, 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 the general public did not like the plastic notes. Uh, it was not adopted anywhere else. I think in India also there are no polymonols. Then the boy, another interesting thing is that I had heard about gold coins from the LDT and I went hunting for them. And in 2003 I found this gold coin in Jaffa. It's uh, It was given by uh, the LDT to various people like Sean I and all the foreign delegates that came into Sri Lanka. They were given back, they were taxed, all the people were taxed by two gold coins. 1990, which is the date mentioned in July 1999, every family had to find two gold sovereigns, big borrow or steel, and give it to the LTT for the fund. And now when it was returned, it says this is, we are returning this loan of two, uh, of 
these two gold coins, they have taken their 10 percent, so this is a 20 carat, they took 22 carat and returned 20, 20 carat gold coins. And I was very lucky to find that nobody else has found, them, have found any of these coins. They must be existing with uh, tiger people, but uh, nothing in public. We next went into the war with the tigers and when uh, Mahindra Rajapaksa sort of won the war in 19, 2009, this issue was done commemorating this, that event. We had another commemorative issue in 2003 when we had posted a showground, uh, which they modified the currency notes and issued. Uh, we issued another note in 2017 to commemorate the 70th anniversary of our independence, which was also a modification of the policy. Okay, so that's a brief outline of what I wanted to talk about. There's a lot more I could talk about, but uh, in a limited time, it's very difficult to go through the whole, whole thing. But that's a thing, if you go to my website, hopefully I'll have it back up very soon. You would be able to see that all the full range of points. If there are any questions, I'd be happy to answer. It's a fake, it's a genuine note, but the rubber stamps are fake. It was, I, the one thing is, it is written there, the Tamil lettering is strong, it talks about, I, I have actually recorded that on my website with a full description of what it is. I even have, they bought it on eBay and rubber stamped it. I even uh, unstamped image, bought from like this dealer on eBay, and the stamp we made in the same series. <laughs> so I have actually put all of that on the website. Completely. I mean, it is the LTD stuff is like popular. Right? They are popular, so they sell. So they are. It may have been the LTD guy itself who wanted to sort of promote the, his logo, so he the cover stamp notes. But he, it was never issued by the LTD. The LTD had banks. Uh, there was a Tamil Bank of Elam, but they used. Sri Lankan currency. They did not use it. But very interestingly, I described this on my website, the central bank didn't send notes to the north, right? So they were stuck with using all these old notes, which mostly dated before 1985, right? So what, what happened was the old note, look at the watermark of our old note, is a lion with a whip. Where the whip is bent, right? And somewhere on 98, there was this story that the LTT had printed coin and uh, notes with the watermark of a lion with a bent sword, right? So I, uh, I tried hard to find out this man, I never found it. Then, about five or ten years ago, uh, some people who had worked in the army said, Ah, we know about this LTT. So I said, Wait and come. I, so I did, they brought it, I said, no, this is a genuine note. This is not printed by the LTT, but it has the old symbol of the sword bed. So finally, what had happened is that all the notes in the Northeast, because the Central Bank had not sent notes up to the Northeast, had this bent sword. So they were, and the people in 1995 or whatever, had forgotten about this bed. I mean, they don't look at notes and all that. They knew that from 87, we had this note with the sword. So that became also a fake story or a misled story that I contacted the security officer who said that he had actually found these notes on an LTT uh, terrorist uh, thing. And I said, yeah, that was Sri Lankan currency, but unfortunately old because the new notes never went into Japan. Hello. Uh, the uh, 1979 series. Yes. Yes, definitely. Why was it issued only once and you never continued afterwards? I, the problem that those notes were designed by Lucky Sen, like he was an artist. So they tried, there is two sets of essays which were done before that. But both did not, act, were not accepted for public, 76 and 77 essay series. 
and then they contacted Lucky Sam Mehta and he did a huge mistake. Two things happened, it was not printed on good paper, and it was sort of fun. They had to, so it didn't, it didn't last very long. It didn't last very long. And the second reason is that the central bank designers didn't like the fact that this was outsourced to somebody else. To, yeah, to an artist or whatever. So this, they said, no, no, we have to bring back the currency design into the central bank. And they internally revolted. And actually, the thousand and the five hundred were also designed by Lucky. And I have managed to find in the original paintings that were sent to Dilaro. I have put that on my website. These are the original paintings that were sent to Dilaro from the artist. And those were used to do those books. Right. So that's an interesting story. I mean, before I have more details, unfortunately, Lucky passed away a few years ago. I met him a few years before that. That's one of the most beautiful. I don't think anywhere in the world they have issued a set of beautiful notes. And each note, I have also documented that on my website, reflects a certain region of the country. So it's not a mixed match of uh, uh, um, animals and birds and fauna. They all come from one particular region in Sri Lanka. So that also I have documented in my website. We are trying to publish a book on that series, I uh, did